Okay, let's uh, work on the liturgy. Uh, remind me, I think we did make our way all the way through this section on the words of institution, which is number 23, which would put us now on number 24. So any, just in, in think, we did close the section number 23 pretty quickly last time, and we were up towards the end of the hour. What, what questions, just in simmering on this or thinking it through, what questions do you have for me about the words of institution or anything we've reviewed up to this point? Okay. I think we did not make it through 24, or we didn't get there. Is that right? We're on 24. So, the, to, so 24 is the Pax Domini. This is a particularly beautiful part of the service. So what, what's gone on so far? Um, we, we've, we've used the words of institution. The, the elements are now what we would call consecrated. So they are now the true body and blood of Jesus. This is indicated by my uh, genuflecting uh, towards them. We, now, uh, we are now having on the altar the body and blood of Jesus. The very first thing, after I genuflect, I stand back up again, I will hold the body of Jesus and his blood in the chalice like this, lift them up before you, and the purpose for this, number one, is to announce something to you and to just really give you occasion, in fact, to worship Jesus as he's now come to us in his body and blood. And so I think it's twofold, two things going on here. So you'll be looking now at the very body and blood of Jesus. But what's the most important thing at this time is the words that are spoken. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And that is just, that is deliberately recalling the words of Jesus on Easter evening. This, this, is, what, this is what you should hear. Every time the Pax Domine, the peace of the Lord be with you, is, is the words when Jesus comes up into the upper room he has, he, by, at this point, has died. He's risen again. He's come with what? His risen body presents it to them. That we're told in Luke's gospel, for instance, that they all wonder if he's a ghost. He demonstrates, I'm not a ghost. This is my true body here in front of you. Not any sort of spiritually kind of thing. My real body. And in his body, he proclaims, peace be with you. Peace to you. That word on, of Jesus on Easter evening and then the next week, peace to you, is read, and I think appropriately, as an absolution for their sins. Right? Now, he, need, he doesn't say, I forgive your sins. But in the middle of what they're going through, after having uh, uh, you know, denied him and they're fighting now and they're doubting and they're not believing the words of the women and so forth, and he's standing there in the midst of them first invisibly and then visibly suddenly, um, they're afraid of him. And when he says peace to you, what he's, he is saying is, I'm not coming after you. I'm not going to judge you for your sins because your sins are forgiven. There's a whole bunch in that little phrase, peace to you. So that, that's, that's in effect what we're seeing here is that when I raise the body and blood of Jesus, it is as though we're in that upper room with the disciples hearing him say to us when all the kind of... Uh, torment of our of our hearts and sins and the stuff that we've done and whatever fears that we have and he says to us don't worry i'm, I'm here I'm, I'm risen from the dead everything's going to be fine the peace of the lord be with you always and that is then why luther makes a big deal out of this he says the, this this is properly an absolution and it's for that reason that your response uh, to the words the peace of the lord be with you always should always be amen and I'm so thankful that that was corrected. It was correct already in TLH. Uh, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. And then in LW, they did this weird, I don't know why, they, the blue hymnal added the, the response, and also with you, which was a huge problem. And to, just uh, completely undersold the real significance of what's going on there, as if this were a greeting, as if at this point in the service, the words of institution have been spoken. We have the Lord's body and blood. And then the pastor says, hey, hey, what's up? Peace be with you. Oh, yeah, yeah, you too. <laughs> this, that is a complete misunderstanding. So I'm glad that this has been re corrected in LSB, back to the way it was always supposed to have been. So the, the response is, amen. You know, if I said, I forgive you all of your sins, then you wouldn't say, oh, yeah, you too. And also with you, you would say, Amen. I, I believe that. Now, did I get everything I, I meant to say there in my notes? Yeah, good. Good. I think I got it. Questions on the Pax Domini? Mark, please.
That's a great question. Mar so what Mark is asking, in effect, uh, maybe I'll, I'm going to change it just a little bit, but if, if we have an altar, um, and I'm saying the words of institution, what, what, is, insti what is now the body of, of Jesus and the blood of, of Jesus? Um, well, basically, it's what we indicate is the body. So that's why we're pointing at it. We're crossing over it. So what I do that over, um, it, it's not magic. This isn't a magic show. Because if there were, if somebody, one of you brought like a bottle of wine and had it in your purse, <laughs> why you would, <laughs> you're in church or something, um, and I said, this is the New Testament in my blood or something, would that become suddenly the blood of Christ there back in the back pew? Uh, no, of course not, because we're not indicating that wine. We're simply indicating the wine that's here in front of us, the, the bread and the wine, which is the body and blood. And for that reason, Mark, if we are nervous or something and we want to have some reserve in the back case we run out, which in fact we do, we put it on a table off to the side so that there's no mistake. We don't, we don't sort of put it over here and then don't point to it because that's just going to leave up in the air as to what is and is not consecrated and not. And so if we happen to run out, we try to get as close as we can, as you know, so we don't have a bunch of left over. Um, and it's, so if we happen to run out, then we just bring more. And if it's the bread or if it's the wine, then we just say that part of the words of institution over it. So if it's the bread, you know, I didn't have to do this today, but last week I did. Um, and I just said the first part, our Lord Jesus Christ on the night. And usually out loud, right, while everything's going on so anybody can see it up in the air still so that you can all tell uh, that we've consecrated this. Uh, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Micah. Right, right. Maybe, maybe that's her reasoning. I don't know. The, pro <laughs> the big problem with LW is that we don't know why they did a lot of what they did. They don't have good notes. They made changes in translations on the hymns. We just don't have notes about why they did this. It was a big mysterious thing. And so why they would have changed it to the, from the traditional amen to the end also with you, I just don't know. Now, if that was the reasoning, what Micah suggested is, well, maybe pastor needs forgiveness and so I'm forgiving all of you, and then you're in turn forgiving me, which is your right to do. Uh, and you, in, the, in the name of Jesus, you can do that. Um, I don't think that's the case. Actually, what, what we usually think is happening is that when the pastor pronounces this on all the people, that one of the people to whom he's pronouncing it is himself. Now, that may seem a little strange, but when I say, I forgive you all of your sins, um, right, one of the people who says amen is me. I'm actually receiving forgiveness from the pastor. It's a little bit strange, but I, I mean, I, I, I give myself communion, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so in a strange sort of way, I don't think that's terribly unusual. Um, okay, uh, other, other questions. Carol. Carol. While you had it in your hand? Yeah. Oh, gosh. See, did you see how that adds such ambiguity yeah. to what's going on? So you have it in your hand. He's up there on the altar. Like what? Um, consecrating the whole congregation at this point? Yeah, I don't think I could have done it. I mean, I think the main reason here, a, a lot of the questions that, that, that gray area questions we have with the Lord's Supper are solved, in our view, by asking the question, does this add to our certainty or take away from it? I mean, I guess you can make an argument that, for instance, that grape juice is some sort of derivation of wine. They both have the same essential ingredients, which is grapes. So can't we use grape juice instead of wine? 
You see what just happened there, though? I know with certainty that the Lord used wine. There's no such thing as grape juice in his day. I know he used wine. I know that's what he wanted us to use. So once I move from wine to grape juice, what have I done? I've added questions. I don't know sh for sure if this is what he wants me to use. And now I've just added questions and doubts about the very gospel that I'm to receive from this. And that's the same thing going on there. Now, did he just consecrate this? I don't, he didn't really, pl I don't know if this is, I, and could it have been, Carol? I think it could have absolutely been, but I, I just don't know. That's not the way the Lord did this. And so that, that's what innovation does. It's the same, we used a lot of the same arguments um, when arguing against this really weak practice of online communion. Um, you know how this went during COVID, and, I, and I, hopefully this is completely gone from the Missouri Synod. It was just the uh, pastors were a little bit stressed out and made some poor decisions in the middle of it. But they, they would get online, and you'd be at home at your dinner table or something and rustle up some, <coughs> you know, I don't know, bread or whatever, and some wine, and you'd set it there, and the pastor would say the words of institution through the computer screen, and then it was supposedly then to be the body and blood of Jesus. It, was it in fact the body and blood of Jesus? Their argument is, well, it's the word of God, isn't it? The word is what has power. Boy, that's a little persuasive. Um, however, uh, the Bible says that we should be gathering together. But Paul says explicitly like five times in 1 Corinthians 11, when you come together, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper. You, when you come together, wait for one. When you come together, we're not coming together if I'm at my... It's just introduced all kinds of what? Doubts. I don't know if this is his, my, the Lord's body and blood for me anymore. And this is exactly the, what the Lord wanted to give through his supper is certainty and confidence. And what such practice has done is breed uncertainty and lack of confidence. So it's just a really a weak thing, I think. Um, okay, other questions? Vic, please. Sorry, why doesn't he? Oh, good question. I'll get to that um, actually in the distribution in, those, in number 26. So can I put you off? Okay. Um, let, let's keep moving here. We'll be on the Agnes Day now, number 25. Uh, the Agnes Day, that translation means Lamb of God, so that's the hymn that we sing. You'll have it memorized, or at least you should. There wouldn't be any reason why you couldn't. Lamb of God, who and I always, no, I don't have it memorized. Not, not because I don't, I don't know, I always forget the tune. So what is it in our, yeah. No, it's, oh, Christ, thou Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of, that's different now. So depending on setting three or one, or they're going to be a different thing. But Agnus Dei means Lamb of God. Let her be specifically in mind, here's the part, it's the part in John chapter 1, verse 29, there's no question. When John the Baptist points to Christ and declares him to be the Lamb of God who bears the sins of the world, we're acknowledging in much the same way that the same Christ who has come into our midst to deliver his mercy and forgiveness uh, to us is there right now. Th th this, is, this is a prayer, or this is a, actually a hymn that we're singing directly to Jesus in his body and blood now present with us on the altar. Right, so that's very clear. Uh, let her see, in effect, this is uh, like the first communion hymn. Um, the pastor and assistants are already taking communion at this point. They're beginning the distribution. There have been differing opinions about if the distribution should start during the Agnus Day or wait until after. In fact, I once knew a pastor who stood with the elements elevated during the entire Agnus Day. He has to do good shoulder exercise workout before that because you've got to hold the whole time, while you, especially if the organist drags it. You know. <laughs> um, However, Luther wanted the dis distribution to begin as soon as possible after the words of institution, and I think it's appropriate to get started without delay. So I'm with Luther on this. Luther did not want there to be any sort of g g kind of gap period between when the words, when the when the elements are consecrated, and when people start eating and drinking them. Right. So that's that's what we're doing. Uh, when we were at Higher Things this week, they did wait. At least I think the one time I can't. They probably I don't know if they waited both times. The closing service I was watching, they waited through the whole Agnes Day. That's fine, I would suppose. And what, that, what was going on there is you had all the pastors, everybody, even the celebrant um, pastor who consecrated the, Lord, the, the elements, were all just standing. 
he wasn't holding it, I don't think. It was, it was now on the altar. But they're all just standing, singing a hymn of praise to the Lord, um, to the Lamb of God who bears the sins of the world. And once the hymn was over, then they'd start distribution. I think that's fine. I've seen that before. I just don't think it's the best practice. I think it's best to get right to it so that there's no waste of time here. Uh, and, not, and not for the sake of time, so that there's no, there's no misunderstanding that these are for anything different than eating and drinking. So we just get right to it. And we would then, therefore, consider the Agnes Day not sort of a part of the liturgy in a sense, but, the, but to be really just the first distribution hymn that we sing. Um, I didn't. I, I really didn't get very, very much into the content of the particular hymn. Maybe I, I don't think I will here, unless you have any particular questions about about the Agnus Dei. Okay. Warm to the distribution, which I think is an important thing for us to talk about. This is probably the part of the service where the congregation is the most active and has the most, like, like you. This would be where you all have the most ceremonies that you would be observing during the entire service, um, I think. The most moving parts during the distribution. A lot of meaning, a lot of important ceremony and traditions that go on during the distribution. So I want you to be aware of some of the ones we do, some of the ones that we're suggesting or at least encouraging for you to consider. So, and, and by the way, you, you, you probably tell this, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just pulling things out that, I, that are on my mind or that I think are relevant, but I'm missing a ton of details. I know that you all have questions, things that we do. You've just something snagged in your mind, and you thought, oh, why did, I wonder why he does that that way. What's he doing right now? How come they, that or this? And I'm not talking about it here, so just ask. I, 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 chances are I might have something to say about it. So, but uh, let's do the all the way through letter P that I have. <laughs> um, Letter A, again, we begin the distribution during the Agnus Day in order to put the distribution as close to the words of institution as possible. Just said that. Letter B, the order of communion. And by order, I mean who goes first. So the pastor's first, and then the assistants, and then all the people after that. The pastor is not the host here. When, when a pastor waits to be the last, he gives a wrong impression that, he is, that he's merely being polite. At all the orders and even the Augsburg Confession, or all the, I should say, the rubrics. I should, that's what I should probably say. The, instru the pastor book instructions for what you're supposed to do during the service, called the rubrics, um, all, all say the pastor takes communion first. And the Augsburg Confession actually has a, has a section, and this is, what, this is why we changed this here a couple years ago, I'd say. I always took communion first, but what we would always do, I'd take communion first, then everybody, and then the assistants would take it last. We changed it a couple years ago because the Augsburg Confession actually says the pastor, then the assistants. That, that's strange, isn't it? The Augsburg Confession isn't, this isn't even a contested point, and yet it mentions it. And so that's the, that's the way we do this. Um, That, so the question, the, no, no, I don't think I don't think that's what's going on. The qu the question is, is that is that because I need to be forgiven first in order to convey it to everybody else? And that's not the reason. the The forgiveness, if if you've been to a church where the pastor goes last, which is very common, it's kind of folksy and nice, um, then you that's as much forgiveness as because the forgiveness comes from the words of Jesus and from His gifts, not from some order, correct order, or something like that. So, well, that too. We've already had the absolution. No, I think what's going on here is that the pastor needs forgiveness, and he is no different in this than, than any of the rest of people. When he waits, to, so he's good. The pastor's probably not going to do it in the middle. He's going to go first or last. That's just going to be the way it shakes out. When he goes last, it gives this impression, like I've noted here, that he's being polite. And I think that's the way a reason a lot of pastors do this. He's being polite, he's letting everybody else go first, and he'll be the last one. I think this is really problematic and actually offensive. 
And the reason for that is because he, he, and that may be polite if he's, if he's having like a back, backyard barbecue or something. <laughs> like, you all get your food first. I'm the host here. This is my meal. I'm, I'm doing that. I'm hosting. Welcome to my house and my table. I'm going to make sure you all eat, and then I'll, if there's enough, I'll have some last. That's, that's polite. Right? But what's the problem with that? I am not the host. Who is the host? Jesus is our host. He is, he is the feast, and he is the host. And I am simply one of the guests, and I happen to be one handing stuff out, but I am just one of the guests. So to avoid anything close to that impression, pastors should not wait to the last. They should be first. And then the assistants, anybody out there helping, is next, and then, and then everybody else after that. Now that gives the impression uh, that I'm it's just as much a sinner, and I need it, it um, just as immediately as everybody else does. The ushers take communion first, actually. Um, it used to be they were last. Oh, you mean the ushers down uh, dismissing everybody? Um, I, I don't. Th that's. I, I don't think that's a thought out ceremony. Um, they could. It could just as easily be that they would go first. I think. I mean, it's worth uh, that. I, oh, I, to be honest, I don't even know that I thought. Has anybody thought of that? Um, Yeah, it could just be a really practical kind of thing that maybe for whatever reason it's easier for them to go last or, or if they, because they can fill in if they need to at the last table or if they don't, they need their own table or however. Um, but if you're an usher here and you want to go first, I think that's fine <laughs> too. Okay, letter C, the pastor self-communes. Uh, this, is, this is also in the rubrics. This is in the instructions, and that not just not just LSB, but this goes all the way certainly back to TLH. This is the normal practice. Luther, in fact, mentions this. <coughs> excuse me, mentions this and insists on it that the pastor should self commune, um, and that, uh, uh, he receives it from the same hands as everybody else. The elder doesn't come up special for anyone else in the congregation. Why would he come up special for the for the pastor? Oh, I get a special person for this. No, um, most pastors will tell you, including me, that I'd like to take communion from the same person that you all take communion from, your pastor. Yeah, so I, I take it from the pastor here, which, is, which means me. Um, so uh, I, I just, I th not only that, I just think it's really weird when the, I, the pastor goes down and it's this big thing, it, it draws attention, rarely does it ever not draw attention to itself. You know, you know the, the elders are coming up and they're communing the pastor and then he's kneeling and everything and he usually does it all by himself. He gets his own little table and, or maybe his wife and his kids all come up around him and it's this kind of homey sort of thing. And it's just not, that, that's, that's new as of the last 50 years. I don't think you would find that in any Lutheran church before 60 years ago. Um, these, the traditional practice is for the pastor to commune himself. Okay. Although... With, uh, we, we know that this is unusual today. When practices change throughout the Missouri Senate or church bodies, they change quickly. And so that, that one was a quick one. But what, the way we're doing it here is thoughtful, deliberate, and it is the traditional practice. All right. Uh, letter, oh, uh, no. It's a good question. Uh, Noah's qu question is, what if you're allergic to something in the Lord's Supper, either the bread or the wine or any other thing? Well, let's just say not allergies, but it could be anything. So, so on the wine side of things, maybe you're on some kind of a medication where you can have zero alcohol. That's profoundly unlikely. Um, but, but just pretend, I suppose. Or pretend that if you took bread of any kind, uh, that, that it, is, it is very scary, deadly kind of thing for you. What, what then should you, what should you do? Uh, and the answer is if we can make concessions on this, we will do it. So I, I think it's okay in the case of bread to use gluten-free. I think gluten-free hosts are bread. Am I right about this? I, I, think, I mean, it's a common thing. Higher Things did it this last week. We do it at conferences and stuff. We don't happen to have anybody requesting gluten-free here. And I don't, I don't advertise it. 
um, because I don't, I think, Noah, that you don't have to have gluten for it to be bread. But I'm not about ready to make a dissertation on what constitutes truly bread. Um, so the preference would be to just use bread. I think gluten-free probably is an okay concession. What I, where I wouldn't go is, is, uh, is alcohol-free wine or grape juice as a concession for the alcohol. Here, if somebody cannot drink wine, it's almost always the case. I mean, I, just always the case that it's not wine itself. It's the volume of wine, even if it's a little bit. So I don't think we're doing this right now for anybody. But we, in the past, we have made extremely diluted wine. And we think that's probably a reasonable concession. What we mean by that is a drop or two of wine and then some water in it. And then that, that would be wine, at least, even if it's really, really diluted. Worst case scenario, you can't take one or the other of them, and you can't take communion. Um, unfortunately, that would just be it, it, just, like a, just like somebody who's a Christian far, far away from a church or a pastor. They have to forgo the Lord's Supper for a while, and they rely upon the Lord's word, their baptism, the absolution, and whatever other gifts the Lord gives. And in this life, they just have that sad, that sad um, component missing. So we go as far as we can to make concessions. But we don't, we, we don't just do anything to make concessions. We don't start substituting out weird stuff, like taking water and saying, well, the Lord, lo, the Lord knows. We, do, we, do not, we don't play with the, with the institution. That's an excellent question. Rita, please. Yeah. Okay. But I've also seen congregations, not denominations, or church, where they will give just the host. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. They won't yeah. give wine. Right. Um. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I don't. I didn't hear a question there. So I want to make well, sure I'm not inventing. So you you mentioned two things. Number one, where there could have been a mistake, and and we forgot to bring the host around, or things got combobulated and all of a sudden you're looking at the wine, the Lord's blood, and you haven't had his body yet. Uh, my, my, what I'd urge you all is to really take ownership of the Lord's Supper in this particular way. Um, you're there to, and I did make a note later on here, but you are there to receive his body and his blood, and you know how this goes. Most of you know this. Um, you know the order. You know how things are supposed to go. <laughs> and so sometimes we forget to dismiss you or we, for, we get mixed up or something. Um, I, it's at that point you can just insert yourself and you can say, I, didn't, I, I haven't received the Lord's blood, and just stop. You do not have to submit to this when you know it's wrong. Just because, just because I've got his blood in front of you, um, stop and tell him, that this is a mistake, I, wanna t I need the Lord's body first. And nobody will be offended by that. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll just skip here to a comment I made. <laughs> this just was on my mind because it because of higher things. This last week I got on the I got on the elevator with a couple boys, uh, not not from March. I didn't know who these boys were, but they were talking, and and uh, one of them said, "I didn't I didn't get any wine. It was it was going so fast. I didn't get any any of the wine." Uh, and I <laughs> and I said, "Well, you didn't get the Lord's blood at, at the Lord's supper? No, because I just he he poured it, and then before it got any, he took it away, and so I didn't get any." I said. You don't let that happen. Stop. You don't let people rush you. There is no rush in the Lord's house. Or, or, by the way, anybody assisting in, in, the, in the communion or anything in the service, there is never a reason to hurry, as if there were an emergency or something. You know, if, if, the, if the nunc dimittis is over and we haven't gotten everything put back together again, there is no hurry. This should be done deliberately, slowly, reverently. We don't have to sort of walk around quickly or stomp or quick or get kind of shaky. No, there's no call for any of that. We just keep going at our pace. It's the same thing here. If you, get, if you don't get any of the blood of Jesus, then, then don't leave the rail. Just stay there. What's that person doing down there? They're still waiting. I don't know. Go ask them. Why are you still here? I didn't get any of the blood of Jesus. Oh, okay. And we will not go at that point like this, oh, like that. We will, we will be deliberate and reverent. 
There is no reason to be not calm. The blood of Christ shed for you. Depart in peace. Amen. So that it's calm and and, and so you don't have to feel bad. You're not holding anything up. Um, you're here to receive the Lord's body and blood, not to fit into the system. Okay. Now, what am I at? What question am I? Yeah. Now, the next, the next thing you mentioned is the receiving of communion in one kind. Um, the Lutherans during the Reformation inherited this, rece receiving the Lord's Supper in one kind. That's a particularly Roman Catholic invention um, that goes back to the Middle Ages. I don't know of any other churches that are only giving communion in one kind except for perhaps the Eastern Orthodox who sometimes practice intinction, which I also mention here later on. Um, I, I wouldn't do it. Um, like when we were up at, um, at LVR this last, what is it, two weeks ago or something, and we had communion, we only had a chalice. I, was, I mean, I wasn't going to bring individual cups. I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't want to clean the cups. So we just had chalice. The chalice, and I, as far as I know, everybody that was there that particular weekend was open to receiving the chalice. If, if they'd have argued with me and wanted to take an individual cup, I, I'd have done it. But I don't think it made a big difference. And so, But then we did have some people that came, and they noticed we were only using the chalice, and they were offended by it. So one of them came and, and received the Lord's body, <laughs> and then when I came by with the chalice, said, no, thank you, to the Lord's blood. And I wouldn't have done that. If, I, if I'd have known that he was going to, only just take the Lord's body. I I wouldn't have given him the Lord's body. Is it going to be one? It's going to be, you know, both or nothing, because if that's in accord with the with the institution of the Lord. And so where we're at right now, Rita, it's body and blood both, right? I, w I wouldn't change that institution. The the way they justified only giving out the bread. Well, we don't know where the practice came from. We're just making guesses. Our guesses usually revolve around they thought that the lay people were too dirty and we're going to slop it around. And the pig farm, yeah, <laughs> yep. The pig, the pig farm. You can kind of, you can kind of put the host in his mouth like this, but and then, but when you come to him with the blood, I mean, what is he? He's going to. What's he got in his fingernails? Ew, I don't know what that is. And did he brush his teeth? Did he have any toothbrushes in? Whatever. So, I think it was just finicky. Um, finicky priests who were thought that they were so holy and the lay people were so dirty and that's where it came from I don't know that for sure the, the, the theology they used to justify this was that it's a doctrine called consubstantiation which means uh, they, 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 they believed that the, the host since it is the body of Christ they reasoned well look it's the body of Christ everybody has what in it blood it's all got blood in it. If it's a true body, it would have blood. And so when you give the one, you get both body and yeah. blood. Right? It, ma it makes sense. It's just not in accord with, uh, with the word, yeah. with the instructions. Yeah. Uh, questions? I got a call. Isaac. The question is, would we have an issue with switching the two around, blood, body, body? Of course, yeah, and that's the reason. It's because that's the way Jesus did that very deliberately. Um, I would suppose, Isaac, I mean, this is just me, but if somebody accidentally got the blood first and I knew they hadn't received the Lord's body, I would just do it that day. I would give him the body second, and I don't think that that would not be the Lord's body and blood. It's just not the way he instituted. That's the sole reason. It's, we're just following his order that I'm aware of. That's the only reason. Yeah. Mark. I wish I'd have been in the way there with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was at an LCMS church once, and brought the folks around. We brought the individual cups around, and I passed. They never brought the chalice, but I was looking down, and all of a sudden somebody was up there, depart in peace, and everybody's standing up, and I'm <laughs> just stayed on my knees and went. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get swept up. So you need, to, you need to resolve. He was mentioning how he was at communion at another church one time, and he didn't get the Lord's blood, and they dismissed him, and he was, they must not have had the chalice. or They, they, didn't, didn't, they didn't come around with the chalice. I don't know. Every, it looked like everybody in the church was taking individual cups. Yeah, they just right, right, right. So they just, they just thought only the pastor takes a chalice or something. Um, and you, just, you would have had to have thought about it beforehand. Well, you have now. So yeah. what, you, 
you just, I think you can just be stubborn on this and not submit to whatever, whatever happened. Um, you, you can't depart in peace. <laughs> if you, if you, I don't care what he says. Uh, you, you need the Lord's blood and then. Yeah, right. I, I, that's what, that's right. I think it could be. Jim, please. When you were growing up, and you grew up in the Catholic Church, why they would put a, little, a couple drops of water in the wine? No, I don't know that. I don't know the reason. If there's some symbolism behind that, the, I, I would have thought that the water was up there for ablution, which is a which is a traditional practice. Ablution just means um, the cleaning of the chalice of some kind. Um, so we, in, it, even we we maybe could or maybe even should be doing this, but we always do it afterwards. We ablute. The, 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 uh, the chalice and the individual cups and everything that's been touched by the Lord's body and blood. A blue just means clean, but we use a, a, a churchly term there, and that is to kind of, get, so that we can deal with that water. Now that's wash the blood, the body and blood of Jesus out in a separate way than we would the water that we're doing just to clean it. That's what I'm like, but I don't know what the two dry, does anybody else know? Isaac, are you answering? Yeah, interesting. It could be symbolic of his. Well, that'd be very profound, symbolic of when when his the uh, the blood and water came out of the Lord's side when they pierced the side. Yeah, but the water is supposed to be going into the font, right? <laughs> Not into the chalice. Okay, that's a that's a good try. So, yeah, Carol. It is. It, so if you only receive the host, would you receive the full forgiveness of sins? Answer, yes. So there are two reasons why we would decide, or more even, why we would decide not to do a thing or to do it. Um, clearly, if it puts in jeopardy the actual gifts which are given, forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation, then clearly we're going to push back and get this right. And I think that does happen when we put things into question like, is this his true body and blood? if we're using grape juice or some substitute thing, I think that puts the whole thing in jeopardy, to be frank with you. But the, the question about mixing things around or only taking the one kind or whatever, that we're, we're saying no to those things, not because we don't think that the Lord's forgiveness is being given, but because it's not according to his institution and we stick as closely to his institution as we possibly can because of his instructions. And so I'm not saying all those years, I think you received the Lord's forgiveness through his body. Luther, you remember, when, when, when the move to being communed in one kind to being communed in two kinds, wh when people were offended by that, it was, it was hard for them to make that move. He, he continued to give communion in one kind for a while, not long, but for a little while. It, for the sake of their weakness, he gave communion in one kind, Luther did. And I don't think he thought, well, this is, we're just making believe now and they're not really receiving forgiveness. It's because they received forgiveness. But it just he wasn't going to let that stand because the Lord says, drink, all of you. And uh, so I don't know, did you track that? What I'm, what I'm saying is just because we say no doesn't mean it's because you're not getting forgiveness. It's, it's because Jesus said to do these things. Yeah, but sh sure, best practice. Tyler. Do you know that they, they diluted the wine? Oh, did he? They diluted the wine, and he knows that. Okay. I mean, they, they didn't dilute it enough. They couldn't get drunk <laughs> because they were getting, in, in Corinth, they were getting drunk. Uh, but, okay, that, you saved the day. <laughs> um, other questions? Noah? Oh, did somebody? Uh-oh.
Yeah, that's good. We've had that happen. Um, if we can keep on going, we'll do it. Uh, if it's a big distraction, we'll stop. Um, we've never had to stop here. Um, and we've had, we've had the paramedics in the, in the sanctuary. It happened to be timed right where we could just keep on going, and the and the paramedics could. It was would have been more distracting to, to actually stop there than, so. We should have a prayer before every service that, that, that the pa poor pastor doesn't have to make decisions like that. <laughs> See, so far, I haven't had to make too serious of decisions. But we'd stop in the middle and then start back up again and finish. Yeah, Jessica. Ah. Yeah. The question is, should we use white or red? It's a, it's a super interesting. You were going to send me this article and then didn't do that. I hold that against you. You couldn't find it. Uh, um, the, uh, you can use either red or white because both red and white wine are wine. So it's either way going to be the, the blood of Jesus. The, the, as I understand it, the Reformed churches, I think, I think, and Micah has an article forthcoming, which I haven't read yet because he can't find it. Um, it's my understanding that the Reformed insist on the use of red wine because the Reformed nearly believe that this is a symbolic thing. Well, white wine isn't a very good symbol, is it, of blood. Red wine is symbolic of blood. Well, we're not, we're not trying to symbolize the Lord's blood. This is his blood. We don't need to try to symbolize anything. So a lot of Lutherans have used white wine simply because it's their way of saying we're not symbolizing anything here. It is his body and blood. Um, and so, for instance, we at Higher Things this week, we were using white wine. And we could use white wine here. Um, I suppose if it became a matter of confession, that's when we would, that's when we would make a, a stand and use maybe like white wine. If somebody said, we have to use white wine. Let's say somebody here, um, you know, I don't know, who, who, who was it that, who would be the sort of person that would insist on this kind of chucks over there? Chuck would probably say, <laughs> I demand it. I demand we use red. I demand we use red wine, because even though we don't know that, that's what Jesus used. I demand it because, uh, because it's red and blood is red, and therefore you have to match symbolically. And so, well, at that point, unfortunately, we would have to we would have to tell uh, Chuck uh, to quiet down, and we'd have to start using white wine to insist on our own our own liberty in that matter. So you watch it, <laughs> Sue, please. Uh -huh. And we didn't have those cups. Uh, that was before, you know, we, but we, we had the chalice and the lenses, and then we got red vintage. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Did you put your hands on that? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't. But I didn't if I held it in my hand, the cup. I might just, uh, maybe I'll, Sue, I could, I think it's the last, no, uh, it, letter M. <coughs> if you look on letter M on my print up. We do not endorse the practice of, quote, intinction, uh, because there is no drinking there. And that's, so that, that's not an uncommon thing in certain churches. They would only have a chalice, but how do they get away with only having a chalice? It's because some people will, will dip. Even, some, even sometimes now, they'll, they'll, we'll have visitors come and try that. <laughs> um, we don't use intinction, um, or we shouldn't be. Uh, and, and that's because when the Lord says drink, um, I think what he means is to drink. Yeah, and there's no, I mean, that actually is a thing different from putting a wet piece of, so that's why. Maybe I actually think that's worse than individual, not that individual cups is bad or something. Our, pre our preference is, is the chalice, but I, I would buy any day of the week, I would take individual cups over intinction um, because it does actually fulf fulfill drinking like the Lord said. Breakdown. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, d I told you beforehand, um, ask me questions. There's all kinds of stuff that comes up. You did that. You took up a lot of, <laughs> I, which I appreciate, and I mean that. Um, the result is we didn't get through all these points that I'm making on the distribution. Take this home with you and just read them. Um, see if they make any sense to you. Make marks. Um, use them to just uh, kind of uh, trigger 
uh, questions for yourself or curious things that you're thinking about. And we will pick up with letter number D next time. That's, I think, where we got. And maybe we'll skip one here or there that we already already reviewed. So, Yeah, Marsha. When you were talking about, Carol was talking about the, the pre-made communion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 My sister brought that up with me and said that. But my thoughts on that is if you're doing something like that and everybody has it, if it somehow, however the Catholics did it, if it, if it goes to, in, you know, the, the, the words of the institution, then my concern would be all the individuals, how they disposed of that cup. Yeah. I, yeah, I'll, tell, like I'll tell you the issue I have real quickly, Marsha, with those little individual sets. It's not the sets themselves. I, I tried to look into those when there were when nursing homes during COVID were requiring them, because they did. I wasn't able to bring in you know just liquids and things because they could be infected with who knows. But we know all that stuff is nonsense now. But that that's what they believed then. And so we, I, I went try to hunt those little kits down, and I couldn't find any that are wine. You can't buy them online because they can't sell alcohol online. I, I'm not so sure those little kits are not always grape juice. I think that's just what they use. And that's a big problem. That's a problem. It's not just cleaning up after, but, but the grape juice part of it, too. They're right, yeah. And it, and it spills all over them. Like, like when you try to open up, um, what do you eat for breakfast? Yogurt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of...